Um, my main point today will be that if you only study journalism as a theory, you are not fully prepared to work as a journalist, and you may very likely be blindsided. The theory makes things seem easy and rational, but life is messy, full of ambiguity, full of contradictions and dilemmas. And I've tried to make that point in this course by putting the biography of Marie Colvin on the course. A textbook can only take you so far. A journalism program can only take you so far. In the field, you are always learning and adapting. If you're appointed to a beat on when you're employed as a journalist, most of what you learn about the specific beat does not come beforehand, but it comes on the beat. You have no idea when you'll be appointed to a beat, and that, that was part of my career. Um, it was always a, a surprise um, when an editor came in one day and would say, Okay, we're changing your beat. Now we're moving you to another beat. Um, there was there was no discussion. Um, there wasn't a lot of advance warning, um, and uh, so that's a typical experience. That um, for the specific beats, you don't really prepare for them ahead of time. You have to uh, learn while you are reporting. Um, so the most we can do in in a journalism program is launch you so that you don't crash uh, at launching and, and burn at liftoff. And once you are airborne, the rest is up to you. Last week, you attended a session with the gar uh, former Guardian A editor, Alan Rusbridger. Um, the Guardian is a remarkable paper. It's done exemplary uh, journalism. It's reinvented itself to stay alive. Um, the Guardian won, the Guardian, the U.S. version of the Guardian won the Pulitzer Prize in the U.S. in 2014 for leading the global coverage of the Edward Snowden revelations into illegal surveillance uh, by U.S. intelligence service of citizens. Uh, Russ Bridger was editor of the Guardian from 19... 95 to 2015, and that was a period of disruption for The Guardian and for the media and for journalists because of people being able to get free information on the internet and because advertising moved online away from the traditional media and to large companies like Facebook and Google, who are among have the lion's share of online advertising, which was a severe loss of revenue for um, the traditional media. Um, I, I read your comments um, in the uh, survey uh, after the Rusbridger session. And what was interesting was that those of you who commented your optimism that, that you found Rusbridger optimistic and encouraging uh, about journalism and a career in, in journalism. And some of you are saying that it, it, it seemed rather gloomy what you're hearing. And um, Rush Bridger, Rush Bridger uh, brought you a, a renewed sense of optimism about a career in journalism. At the very end, Rush Bridger was asked for his advice for the kind of skills someone needs seeking employment in the media today you might have expected him to talk about your technology skills, about skills in data mining. Um, instead, his answer was, quote, build your, old, your own brand and do the things you consider valuable, end quote, and also be entrepreneurial. So what does that mean, um, build your own brand? It means that you need to distinguish yourself by finding a niche in reporting that you do better than anybody else. So for example, Marie Colvin created her own niche and brand in reporting with compassion by 
reporting with compassion and humanity from conflict zones what was happening to innocent victims. That involved enterprise reporting. That is, instead of attending government and military press briefings, which Colvin hoard because of the one-sided manipulation. Uh, instead, she took the riskier, more difficult path of going under the wire or outside protected areas and into the conflict zone. Uh, I, another journalist uh, who did something similar, except with photojournalism, is Deborah Kopakin Kogan, which uh, Kogan recounts in her memoir, Shutter Bay, which is well worth reading. Uh, sometimes when I teach photojournalism, I put Kogan's book, Shutter Babe, on the course. Uh, and so Kogan went under the wire, for example, to travel with Muslim feed, uh, freedom fighters, the Mujahideen in Af Afghanistan, sleeping with them alone in caves. Uh, she was Jewish, Jewish with these um, Muslim freedom fighters, and, and she, uh, she never disclosed that to him. Or consider the brand that the Italian journalist Oriana Falacci created for herself as an interviewer for the most of the most powerful leaders of the world. Or consider Julian Scher. He's a Canadian investigative journalist He's a, a senior producer with CBC's Fifth Estate, and his niche is biker gangs and human trafficking. He has a very specific niche in Canada, biker gang, gangs and human trafficking. A brand could be a specialized topic. For example, right now it might be data rights and blockchain issues. Uh, it probably should be both esoteric and yet strong in news values. Even if you want to be a, a freelance feature writer, you need to consider either a popular topic with a, a, a big audience or news values. Uh, using the technology or the platform you use is not a brand because everybody else can use the same technology and the same platform. Um, but then, of course, an exception comes along, a name that Russ Bridger mentioned, Elliot Higgins, and the website he created called Bellingcat. Uh, Elliot Higgins is not trained in journalism. He's, he's a college dropout. He started as an unemployed citizen journalist blogger, and then in 2014 founded a website called Bellingcat, for citizen journalists to use technology and open source material to investigate news events. And uh, one of the events they investigated was the downing of flight MH17 over the Ukraine. Um, if you wanna specialize in freelance podcasting, as some in this class do, you still need a brand, brand to distinguish your podcasts. Uh, some of the journalists doing podcasts now come into podcasting as a recon recognizable brand name uh, and they already have their own audience. They just move and migrate their audience to their podcast and, and then they have the advantage they don't need to build an audience from scratch. And that's one of the big problems in creating your podcast brand is building your audience. Uh, freelance podcasting is technically easy to do and easy to publish, but it's difficult to attract an audience and build that audience and promote your podcast. The second piece of advice that Russ Bridger had for skills is be entrepreneurial. So what does that mean? Well, it means to market and sell yourself. And that idea signals that getting a job in journalism means entering a competitive marketplace. If you're doing freelance radio work for CBC, then CBC is doing the marketing and CBC has built the audience for you. 
if you want to create your own freelance broadcasts or create a freelance career for yourself, you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to sell and market yourself and build your brand. You have to compete with others. But doing that, selling and marketing yourself and building your brand is like having a third career. Selling and marketing yourself takes a lot of time and energy. And so you have to find time for that third career of marketing yourself. It takes persistence and stamina, believe me. Personally, to be honest, I never liked the financial stress of being a freelance writer, particularly when I had a, a family to support. I liked a regular paycheck, even if, if it meant a loss of freedom. Too much freedom can be stressful. If you want financial security and a freelance career, then you need a job to finance your freelance career. And that's what I'm doing now. My strategy in teaching journalism was to collect a paycheck for teaching what I believe in and to use that career teaching to finance freelance writing. But that also means that I have to market myself. And like I said, marketing yourself in the freelance market is like a third job, a third career. Um, so last week, I asked everybody in the group, what would your brand be? What would you uh, wish that your brand could be? And that's a starting point for you. And my advice is that you should start thinking about that now, not wait until graduation. Think about this. When you graduate with a Bachelor of Journalism degree or any kind of degree four years from now, and you apply for an entry-level job, say, in journalism, although some people in this class uh, don't see careers in journalism for themselves, but, but this advice still applies. Um, you will be competing against others just like you. Fresh graduates, fresh from a journalism program or another type of a program. Your degree is not an immediate entry into a job. You still have to compete for jobs. So what distinguishes you from everybody else with a degree? Last week, an email was circulated to our journalism students about a job opening in a newspaper in Musumin, Saskatchewan. And the newspaper is <laughs> a bit of an odd name, the World Spectator, but you have to understand this is a newspaper that's been publishing since 1884. Right now, it's too early for you to apply for that job, but look at the requirements for the job in the email. What is the editor looking for? Because it's typical of entry-level journalism um, jobs. And what you need to look at is what is the editor looking for? in hiring somebody, not what interests you because it's getting hired is not about you. It's not about your wishes and hopes. It's what the company wants, what the editor wants. So what did this email say? Well, first off, the editor says he's looking for somebody who is passionate, um, who is, and, and that's why the biography in Extremis is on this course to give you a sense of passion and mission for journalism. And it, it's probably no accident and it's typical that that's the first thing the editor talks about, a passion for journalism. How are you gonna display your passion for journalism in, uh, in a job interview? You just, you have to do more than say, I, I'm passionate about journalism. What's your proof? What have you done that demonstrates in your life that you have a passion for journalism. What else? Well, the editor, the email also says that the editor is looking for someone with a strong news judgment. And that's one of the key elements I've stressed in this course 
news judgment. And there you see in um, the criteria for hiring, strong news judgment and solid interviewing skills. Again, which this course covers because this course is designed to prepare you with employment skills in journalism. Strong news judgment, strong interviewing skills, passion for journalism. Um, what else? Okay. Um, the email also lists the ability to generate story ideas. That's important. That's, that's tricky, and that takes more time to develop. Um, I think it's something more than we can do in an introductory course like this. I think it's something we have to do in, in our other, uh, other journalism courses, um, give you assignments where you generate uh, your own story idea. Um, what else? The letter uh, email talks about um, uh, skill in news photography. Uh, these days, uh, the um, traditional print outlets have pretty much uh, migrated to online, which means they need visual material. They need uh, photography, they need videography. And so that's an important skill. And you can see this entry level position is asking you, uh, is asking people, uh, looking for people's skills in news photography and also asking for knowledge in the layout program in design which um, I've been teaching for, uh, for years um, for a course in our program. So these are all typical criteria you're going to see in the next few years. And my advice is that you pay attention to this criteria for jobs now rather than uh, once you reach graduation. Um, like I said, you know, getting a job in, in journalism is not about what you would like to do it's a what, a what, about what the media company wants to do. So when you graduate in, in three or four years and you're competing for a job in journalism or a job in anything else, you need more than a degree like everybody else. The de degree only gets you past the first preliminary round. After that, the real competition starts. You need proof that you are enterprising as a journalist. You need high quality publications for your clipping file and you need high quality news photos for your clipping file. If you're aiming at broadcast journalism um, and, and our journalism program here does not have a focus on broadcast journalism, but I hope we do enough to lay the groundwork to help you if that's your interest. If you're aiming for a career in broadcast journalism, you need examples of high quality broadcasts that you have done. Before I came to teach at this university during my career as a journalist, when I was an editor, I hired students fresh out of journalism school. And I was looking for the same things. I was looking, I knew I was looking for someone with a passion for journalism someone with good news judgment, and somebody who showed, already showed enterprise in his or his or her clipping file, even though uh, this person was just graduated. So in this course, the news story assignment is a starting point for that, to help you experience, get outside of theory, get outside of reading the textbook, and experience what happens in a, in a news gathering situation. And so the assignment helps you with that. But if you really want to be competitive when you graduate, uh, you need to show enterprise and get published in a large publication. And you don't really need many publications like that. I would say offhand, maybe five. Um, but five enterprising publications in, in large publications is better than an endless series of mediocre stories. In the hiring meeting, when the editor is looking at your clipping file, 
the editor doesn't want to read 50 mediocre stories. The editor wants his or her attention to be caught by three or four or five really interesting um, newsworthy stories. If you're aiming for a career in broadcast journalism, you need to do what's analogous for broadcast uh, journalism. Um, and um, it would be a good idea to sell, uh, see if you could get um, you know, a podcast um, um, posted on a large uh, broadcast website so that you could um, put that in your clipping file. My advice is make the next few years count now for your future career. I think I already gave you an example of a student uh, who published an assignment in one of my courses that I arranged to be published in a national magazine. Uh, that was a justice story. And I'm going to talk today about the justice beat. That was a justice story that originated in a small um, court case in Kamloops about a man sentenced to six weeks in prison for ordering a hamburger he couldn't pay for. And for that story, I, I gave the, uh, the, the, the man a name, the hamburger thief. Other store, students of mine have done the same. They've published course assignments and they had uh, their own ideas for freelance articles, which they published. And I'm always glad to help anybody, any student of mine, uh, working on a freelance idea or pitching a freelance idea, even if it's not part of a, a course of, my, of mine. And I've, I've done that for students in the past. The secret to that, um, and the secret to publishing freelance now is coming up with a newsworthy story idea and being able to conduct the interviews that make it work. So come up with newsworthy ideas Create your own brand, be an entrepreneurial, market, and sell yourself. Um, the session this week is about justice reporting, which covers the three separate main beats in journalism of the crime beat, the court beat, and the prison beat. Um, and I've done all three separate beats. And I mentioned this so you understand that where my insight comes from into these. As a crime reporter, my main source or any person's source on the beat is going to be the police, that part of the justice institution. And the police make the, the crime beat somewhat easy and routine. The police want a good relationship with the media to be able to communicate with the public. Uh, the media already have the audience that the police want to reach. So you, you, uh, it, it, you create uh, it's a symbiotic relationship there um, that the media depend on the police and the police depend on, on the media. So you want to build a good relationship, a good rapport. Um, a reporter is unlikely to witness crime. It's not like Marie Colvin going into conflict zones where conflict is pretty much guaranteed. Um, you can't do that as a crime reporter. You don't know when and where crime is going to be committed. Um, the police issue press releases and the uh, police media officer is available um, to all the media and to the broadcast media to be on camera. But although the police make the beat somewhat easy, all the reporters in the city have the same access to police and all the reporter get the same details. So it makes your job easier but it doesn't make you competitive. And thinking back to my own career, um, that's how I ended up photographing uh, the police raiding and busting 
uh, a suspect for selling stolen goods. And that's how I ended up in the Dominican Republic, which is an island in the Caribbean, hunting for a Canadian man who was a fugitive for the police in Canada. That's uh, enterprise. So how did I police, how did I photograph a police raid? Well, um, I built a rapport with the, the police in the city where I was working, and I gained a reputation for being fair, honest, and trustworthy. Um, and sometimes that was difficult because other reporters on the newspaper were unfair, dishonest, and trustworthy. And so it takes time to build trust with police officers. Now, that doesn't mean that you write stories that glorify the police. That's just being a weasel. And police officers don't like weasels. Nobody likes weasels. Nobody trusts a weasel. A, a weasel can turn against you and you know, the weasel isn't trustworthy. What the police want is a fair and balanced story, even if it challenges them. Now, there was a, a police investigator in, in the city where I worked in, in the police department who I knew would make a good source. The problem was that he felt burned by another reporter at my newspaper. That reporter had written a story that a police officer had bought tools that were auctioned off at a police auction because they had been confiscated as part of an investigation. Anybody can go to a police auction and and uh, and bid for these. So that there was there was nothing underhand about that. But a reporter had done that story. The officer felt unfairly targeted uh, by the story. So it took time to earn his trust and and respect. In the end, and 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 that what this is about is um, networking, building sources, uh, building uh, trust. So the officer ended up doing me two favors. Uh, he let me interview him about an investigation that was secret into fencing stolen property through secondhand stores. The background and the context of this is that uh, at that time, pawn shops were required by law to keep records of who was pawning goods, which could then be used to identify somebody who was fencing stolen property through pawn shops. But the law did not apply at that time to secondhand stores, and the criminals realized it. Um, so um, the officer couldn't allow me to photograph a raid as part of, uh, of, of this, this, this project. Um, uh, it, was, it wasn't going to issue uh, uh, a press release that they were doing a raid. But one day he said to me, <clears throat> if you're sitting in your car outside the police detachment at 8 a.m. on a certain day and you see us drive out, um, there's nothing to stop you from following us. So at 8 a.m. on the day I am sitting outside in my car, the officer pulls out in his car and I follow him. At one intersection, I was cut off by another car and I didn't want to drive dangerously, even if it meant losing the police officer. So, you know, I took my time and uh, waited for the car to pass and then turned out and I thought, oh, well, there it goes. You know, the officer will be gone. When I turned the corner and went through the, the, the intersection, I saw that the officer was parked waiting in the street. And when he saw me, he pulled out uh, and I followed him again. So I was the only reporter in town to photograph that raid and, and that arrest. The other uh, big favor that the officer did, did for me was he told me about this secret investigation into um, fencing stolen goods through secondhand stores. 
And he let me do interviews, interview him, and gather notes for 30 days without publishing. And we made a deal, what's typical, it's called the embargoed story. And so the deal is that when a journalist is given information on advance, uh, there's a condition that it not be published until a certain date. Uh, that's done fairly routinely, for instance, with federal budgets. A group of reporters uh, may be given an advance copy of the federal budget to read and write the story, but not publish the story until the budget is released public in parliament. Sometimes the journalists are sequestered for a day in a room where they can read the budget in advance and not publish it. So um, that kind of embargo deal um, is, is typical. Um, and the advantage for me um, was that I would have the time to write a longer story, do interviews, gather more information than the other media. And so um, I, could, um, I could publish a scoop. However, it didn't happen that way. Um, we learned suddenly on um, that uh, the police had called a sudden press conference for Saturday uh, for all the media in town to um, release the information about this investigation. And that would mean that the broadcast media would be able to publish uh, the story on Saturday. Um, but this being in, in pre-internet times, uh, um, we couldn't publish the story until two days later on Monday. Um, and so the advantage of the embargo um, was, um, was slipping away if, if the uh, broadcast media could, could publish two days before. Uh, and that was a betrayal. And my source apologized to me that uh, it was out of his control, and I understood that. Um, the decision had been made by police officers above him. Fair enough. I informed the city editor, and the city editor was an unethical jerk. And the city editor said to me, let's publish the story on Friday before Saturday's press conference. He said the police had broken their promise to me. So that meant we were free to break my promise to them. I saw it differently. Just because a promise was broken to me doesn't mean that I should break a promise in return. If I break a promise to the police, how can they trust me after that? Um, um, if I kept my promise when they broke their promise, then there would be be even more reason to trust me. So what was more important? Um, um, scooping the other media by one day um, or being ethical, um, maintaining the trust of an important source. Remember I said that on the crime beat, the police are your main source. Uh, and what about keeping that channel of communication uh, open. So I wasn't going to break my promise. I told the story that the edit, uh, that the story wasn't ready to publish on Friday, uh, but I could write it on Friday and we could publish on Saturday. And <clears throat> although we'd be publishing the same time uh, as the broadcast media, uh, uh, we would have lots more information than, than they would. Another enterprise uh, story I mentioned on the police beat, remember I saying again, um, the, the police beat has an easy source of information, information that you really can't get as a journalist, um, uh, but um, at the cost of, of limiting um, what you can do. Uh, one time I broke out of that um, 
did some enterprise reporting, I mentioned tracking a, a Canadian um, to the Dominican Republic who was a fugitive uh, from the police in Canada. At the time, uh, and probably still today, Canada didn't have an extradition treaty with the Dominican Republic. And so that it meant that even though the person was charged in Canada, he couldn't be extradited back to Canada. Uh, he had uh, uh, he had his own villa on the ocean in the Dominican Republic, so he could stay there as long as he wanted and not be extradited. I don't I don't think the police actually knew where he was. The problem was that the Canadian was living at an unlisted address with an unlisted phone number, and I didn't have the address, but it was a big story. Um, the uh, the man who was charged was a decorated war hero from World War II. He was wealthy. He was a pillar of the community. He had run for political office, and he was charged as a pedophile for abusing boys. Um, I convinced my newspaper to send me to the Dominican Republic to try and locate him. Uh, to be honest, I liked the idea of being paid uh, to spend two weeks on an island in the Caribbean looking for a fugitive. It was a lot of work to track the man down. I won't go into detail now how I did that, but I will make the point that um, you have to teach yourself on the job and stories can be so different. So that, you know, um, tracking a fugitive in the Dominican Republic is different from other stories, and you don't take a course on that in, in university. You have to figure out how to do it yourself. Um, so it was, it was quite complicated, but I did. I found him. I interviewed him. The story was published. Several weeks after the stories were published, the phone rings in the office. I pick it up, and it's a reporter from the Toronto Star, and he says, I'm in the Dominican uh, Republic right now, and I'm looking for this guy, and I can't find it. I can't find him. And he said, how did you find him? Okay. And my answer was, well, that's what my newspaper paid me to do. In other words, it was my scoop, my enterprise, <clears throat> and there's no benefit to give it away to the competition. Several months later, probably because of the pressure of my story, <clears throat> the police in the Dominican public seized the man without a warrant and with no apparent reason, and they put him on a plane to Canada, um, alerting the police in Canada to be at the airplane to meet him when he landed in Canada, and he landed, you know, still in his beach clothes still in his sandals. Uh, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to prison. Uh, when I was on the police beat or the, also the emergency beat, um, I had an advantage at the time of a scanner in my office so I could hear emergency calls the minute they were issued. Um, during my time as a reporter, um, uh, initially we were able to hear the police calls on the scanner and then they went to a separate communication system that we couldn't scan, which is probably an advantage because you don't want the, the criminals to be able to scan the police um, communications. Um, uh, but even though we lost the, the uh, police communications on the scanner, we still called for the fire department and the ambulance. And that was usually enough. Um, and uh, sometimes I would get to a fire before the fire department, and, and sometimes I get to an accident on the freeway before the police or before the ambulance. I guess today the version would be, um, you know, you would, you would watch Twitter and, uh, and, and for citizens uh, alerting you to this, uh, to this sort of thing. Um, at, at the scene, I didn't want to interrupt uh, police officers, they're usually busy. So I just asked the police officer, and this is key, when the police officer would be back in the office so that I could phone him. It's a small detail, an important detail. 
Otherwise, if I didn't know what time the officer would be back in the office, I could be phoning all day trying to, to get the officer on the phone. Small detail, important detail. And you learn things like that on the job. Um, accident scenes, uh, I learned, and fire scenes are, are sometimes the best for photos in the first few minutes. And after that, they're not as good. So I needed to get there um, before the police and the fire department. And um, if, I, if, I, if I did arrive, and, and, and fairly frequently I, I did get there uh, first, um, um, if I did arrive before the fire department, um, I wanted to be able to photograph the burst of smoke when the uh, water from the hose fits, hits the fire. And that lasts for about two minutes. And you get this great graphic explosion of, of smoke. Uh, and, and that's only a minute or two. After that, it's gone. You, you just left with a, a, mediocre, uh, a mediocre photo. Um, and same thing. Um, with the uh, ambulances, I would arrive before the ambulance um, and and then uh, get dramatic photos of somebody on a stretcher being loaded into the ambulance. When I when I arrived in an accident scene um, on the freeway, small detail, important detail. I always parked in front of the car rather than behind the car. The reason for that is. When I parked in front of the burning car or a car accident, when I parked in front, I could get the firefighters running towards the fire and I could get their faces. If I was behind the car, um, besides being inconvenient for the fire vehicles, which you don't want to do, or the police vehicles, which you don't want to do, um, I might only be able to get the backs of the firefighters, which doesn't make as as good a photo. Uh, and as well, when you're parked in front, if the traffic gets tied up, uh, you can get away when everybody else couldn't. The point of this is that these are, are kind of small um, details, um, too numerous to mention all of them, things that you really teach yourself on the job. Um, the court beat. I said that I've done the crime beat, the court beat, the prison beat. They're all separate beats. Um, on, um, on the court beat, that's what I did all day long, five days a week. Go to court, take notes, do occasional interviews, and file the story before the end of the day. I covered bizarre murder trials, but to be honest, I found it, for the most part, monotonous and unenterprising because you're stuck in the same typical courtroom all day and your ability to do interviews is confined. The challenging part is the technical aspect of the law and courtroom procedure. Unless you've got um, training, law training, you don't know that when you start the court beat. Um, so, and on court beat, you have to know the technical aspects and be able to communicate them in colloquial language for general reader. And that's a real intellectual challenge. It's a real challenge in, um, in, in, in writing. So I liked that part of it. And that's the part that technical insight into the law and courtroom procedure is what distinguishes you. Um, but for somebody just starting a career in journalism, being sent to a court case can be intimidating, and you can expect that that would happen. It, it's, a, um, it's an intimidating situation because it's like being in a foreign country. Uh, there are rules and regulations and a technical language that you're not familiar with, and you may find it bewildering to figure out what's happening, but you have to start uh, somewhere. As for that reason, that when I've done this uh, course in the past, I've done field trips uh, with students to the courthouse in, in Kamloops and to city hall meetings. Um, and um, what I'm trying to do in that 
uh, is expose the students to um, uh, to this a, a, a intimidating, bewildering experience. So they get a, a bit of a taste for it. And they get a bit more confident in being able um, to to do that kind of reporting. You know, it's not it's not as hard, but the first times you do it, um, it, it can be confusing. I remember one time that uh, 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 one of our students had graduated and he was hired by a daily newspaper on graduation. And the editor asked him to cover a court case and he said, oh, I, I can't do, I, I can't do that. I've never done it before. He was just too intimidated for that. Years later, he was on the court beat and, and it was easy for him. So it can be intimidating at first, but later it can feel routine and you're limited um, in what you can do. Why is it limited? Well, uh, once someone is charged with a crime and until there's a the decision in the course case, which can take years, you are limited in Canada legally to what you can report. Once the charge has been laid, basically you can publish only what the police release and what happens in court. You really don't have the freedom to do your own investigation and your own interviewing because you could publish material that would prejudice the court case. And if you publish material that prejudices the court case uh, before there's a... Um, uh, uh, um, a judgment, uh, the judge can find you in contempt of court under the law. And the judge will do that because they want to preserve the system um, from anything that would uh, prejudice a case. Um, crime reporting is different because um, that usually happens um, between the time a crime is committed and the time that our charges are laid. So legally, between the time a crime is committed, the police are investigating till the um, charges are laid, you have more freedom um, in what you investigate. Um, there's no uh, possibility of contempt of court. You can't prejudice the case because there's not a, a case un until charges are laid. Um, so that's, uh, there's more freedom in on the crime beat than there is on the court beat. Uh, what the court beat is, is basically sitting in court taking notes. Um, and I'm going to explain in more detail later in this course the legal distinctions of libel and contempt of course uh, in a session on media law for journalists. So you get a sense of what your legal limitations are in reporting. And by the way, the legal limitations in reporting are the same whether you're a reporter or whether you're a citizen posting on Facebook. The same legal distinctions apply to all citizens, not just journalists. So for me, um, court reporting was monotonous um, and unenterprising and I didn't feel the, um, uh, the kind of challenge I liked. Um, you know, it, it, it did require a lot of skill in note taking, a lot of skill in writing the story. Um, and, and like I said, there's a real uh, skill, technical skill in understanding the law, understanding courtroom procedure and uh, being able to write that for a colloquial audience. And that's why if you turn to TV, um, um, uh, t TV shows about lawyers and, and courtroom um, do well on TV. They're very dramatic. Um, it's when you're reporting on it, um, you know, you're there for hours and hours and hours, and there may only be a few climactic moments. And on, on TV, in the fiction, they just focus on the climactic moments. But court cases are dramatic. And the technical details, um, the intellectual challenges uh, can be dramatic. And like I said, the example of that is um, the number of 
uh, shows you, you see on TV about lawyers and, and court cases. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of time that people don't see where you're just sitting there in court. Um, I remember, I still remember one day, I spent the whole day in court um, because the jury was out and deliberating. I couldn't leave because I didn't know um, when the jury would reach a decision. And uh, I had to be there when the decision was made and, 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 um, and when a judge makes a ruling, that might take 15 minutes. Um, and if you're not there when it happens, you haven't got the story. Um, and so I remember one day sitting in court all day reading and I read uh, Michael Crichton's science fiction novel, Sphere, Sphere, great, uh, great novel. I kind of enjoyed reading it, honestly. And they made a movie into it later, Sphere with Dustin Hoffman and Sharon Stone. I also used my time to read law texts to help me understand as a court or reporting. I, you know, I had no um, legal training uh, myself. Uh, the provincial courthouse in the city where I was working at a cafeteria, and the cafeteria was useful for me as a reporter because um, it was a setting where I could find lawyers and prosecutors in one place with time on their hands to chat, where she'd go to the office, their offices, they're busy. Um, so cafe cafeteria was a, a great place to uh, chat with lawyers and prosecutors and, and, and get tips. And as a journalist, you look for places like that um, um, that um, make inaccessible people accessible um, to you. And in the past, I said that I've taken uh, students in this course to the courthouse in Camas to attend trials. Um, one time we attended a trial that was literally like a Hollywood horror film. A man had killed his three stepchildren and wrote on the walls of the house in blood. He was schizophrenic. He heard voices. He believed he was saving the children by killing them. Um, and like a, as a reporter, I covered bizarre uh, trials like that. Another time I took um, uh, the class to a trial. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, because I had to do it during um, scheduled classroom time, it wasn't possible to um, always to predict in advance um, uh, when there would be a trial and what moment in the trial we would be able to attend. But one day we attended and um, we sat in the trial of, of an indigenous trans transgender teen who had been charged with breaking into homes in Kamloops and, and stealing cars to joyride. Now, that trial had an interesting social dimension and oddly, it wasn't covered by local newspapers. You know, honestly, um, I felt sitting in the courtroom with, uh, with a class that day, I felt um, this was the kind of day I would have relished as a court reporter um, because of the significance you could find in this story. And, and, and the legal case was, was simple. Was the teen guilty of breaking into homes and stealing cars? Yes, she was guilty. What was interesting was the social issue, which was not a legal issue and was not the concern uh, of the case. And the social issue was that this teen was a victim of broken and dysfunctional homes. So, like I said, that's not, as a social issue, not a legal issue. It's not relevant to the guilt or innocence, but as a reporter, you're free to make, to write that story. You're free to see that story, to see beyond the legal issues into a larger story, and everything is there packaged for you. You don't have to run 
after people to interview. Um, and, it, and it would be very difficult in a story like this to, to interview people, to get their stories. The story is there packaged for you in the courtroom if you have the insight to see the larger story. So the larger story, not the legal story, was that this teen was a victim of broken and dysfunctional homes. Um, and um, we got more details about this um, um, because I, I arranged for the defense lawyer to do uh, a separate private session with the class right in in the in, in the uh, in a court in the court uh, office. Um, however, the the background this victim of broken dysfunctional homes wasn't relevant to the court case in terms of guilt or innocence, but it was relevant to the sentencing and the judge was listening. Um, and so as the lawyer explained more fully to class, the sentencing was designed to help re rehabilitate the teen and repair the damage in her upbringing. Um, and the lawyer told us that what he wanted to accomplish uh, was a sentencing that would help the team. And that was a great lesson for the class. There was a bigger, more newsworthy story than a teen breaking into houses. Uh, and the newsworthy story started with the legal court case, but it transcended the court case. And that's the kind of story you feel proud of to write as a journalist. That's a story that with insight, you take beyond the, the court case. I mentioned um, that a student in one of my classes published a story in a national magazine about a local trial in Kamloops. And I want to use this as another example of, of how you can take um, the routine of court coverage and make something bigger uh, and better in the social in interest. So what happened in this case, um, that there was a, a story of a few paragraphs um, in the Kamloops newspaper about a man being convicted of ordering a hamburger he couldn't pay for and being sentenced to six weeks in prison. When I read that, it sounded to me odd. Why would somebody be sentenced to six weeks for stealing a hamburger. It sounded like an injustice. I, I had an, an instinct that there was a story there. Now, I didn't know that there was a story there, but that was my instinct. Something sounded odd. There sounded like some kind of injustice. So I asked the class, who'd like to write this story? Only one person put up her hand. Uh, it was a complicated, difficult story. But the student was persistent and didn't give up. And I coached her through the story. Um, part of it involved going to the courthouse to search the records, the court records. Um, it, it meant getting permission to interview the man in prison, which the student did. She asked me, um, should I wait till he gets out of prison? And I said, no, no. You want to interview him in the setting of being in prison so that you can describe that um, uh, in your story. And it meant interviewing the defense lawyer and usually defense lawyers like to talk. And the student hit pay dirt with the court records. Um, that, and, and she got access through the court records to a psychiatric report that was used in the court case to show that the man had an organic brain disorder so they couldn't stop himself from ordering hamburgers he couldn't pay for. He was a serial hamburger thief because he had an organic brain disorder. That made the story more newsworthy because at the time I was chair of the Citizens Advisory Board for the Kamloops Maximum Security uh, Prison. And I had access to a psychology study that wasn't widely known and this study showed that 40% of the 
of BC offenders in BC prisons were imprisoned because, primarily because of mental problems. That was the news value of magnitude. That is connecting this one incident to multiple incidents. So this local court case represented a larger problem of, in the justice system of sending people to prison for mental problems. That gave a single bizarre local story a larger and more newsworthy scope. That was the winning combination. And after the student had finished the story, I contacted an editor that I knew at a national magazine, and the story was published uh, in, in a national um, magazine while the student was still in journalism school. That story, you get several lessons. One lesson is that you can be enterprising and find publishable stories close to home. Another lesson is that stories are often unique and require perception to see. Another lesson is that you need to apply news values and be persistent. And another lesson is that you can be enterprising and publish while you are in journalism school as a step towards being competitive for, uh, for, uh, for a job. Finally, let me end up quickly with prison reporting. Um, prison reporting, being on the prison beat, was probably the most unusual reporting I did and what I liked best. I liked it because it was more challenging than other beats and because it was easier for me to develop sources and scoops that other report reporters couldn't. Um, the reason um, I could uh, develop scoops was because of an unusual local situation. Um, the prison beat is not a common newspaper beat in Canada, but I was working for the daily newspaper in Kingston, Ontario, which at that time had eight federal prisons, one of them the only federal women's prison in Canada, and that made uh, the city of Kingston the prison capital of Canada. Given the number of prisons, that meant that thousands of people in the area of the newspaper worked for prisons, um, uh, compounded by families and neighbors. So that created a lot more interest in that kind of stories. Also, um, the prison beat in for fe uh, federal prisons had a national profile uh, as long as a local profile. So that was a an unusual opportunity to be in a city with more federal prisons, a concentration of federal prisons that other cities don't have. As with the crime beat, uh, <clears throat> the sources were first official from prison officials, but there were also a guards union and prisoners' rights group. Plus, I also developed sources among the prisoners. In some cases, the prisoners would phone me from prison with a, with a tip. So you can see that the prison beat had an advantage in crime reporting that the court beat and um, the crime beat don't have. Once, once people have been convicted of a crime, they have nothing to lose by talking to a reporter and so that they can become sources. The cons can be sources in a way that um, um, people being investigated don't want to be sources and, and people going through court generally don't like to be sources. So there's a huge, really interesting advantage in the prison beat <clears throat> of, of, uh, of having um, prisoners as sources. Um, and one of the things I did to be enterprising <clears throat> and to develop sources was I, I, um, I volunteered to be a volunteer prison escort in my spare time. So I'd work all day at the newspaper, <clears throat> and then once a week, I would spend the evening as a volunteer prison, prisoner escort. <clears throat> and as that, 
I ended up taking a prisoner from prison to the local TV station at night where he was the host of a cable TV show uh, called Prison Life TV. The show was run entirely by cons and ex-cons, uh, and they had great guests on the show. So I got to know the cons. I got to know the guests. That connection, in turn, <clears throat> made it easier for me to gain the trust of other prisoners, develop sources. Uh, it also resulted in a connection uh, so that I could in interview Guy Paul Moran at the federal uh, Moran inquiry. Uh, Moran, <clears throat> in background, was wrongly convicted of murder on circumstantial evidence. And later, after he'd spent time in Kingston Max, uh, Maximum Security Prison, which is a tough prison, he was exonerated and a federal inquiry uh, <clears throat> was, was called to examine the wrongful uh, conviction. I also covered a, a major uh, prison inquiry during that time uh, <clears throat> and uh, actually got a scoop out of the inquiry, even though all the other national media were at um, were at the the the, the prison um, the prison inquiry. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't have time right now uh, to go in in into into how I got a scoop with all the a national scoop with all the other media there. Um, but just one final comment. <clears throat> the, the, the prison brief for me became a brand. Um, and so besides publish became my brand, one of my brands, besides publishing newspaper stories, I published a book on the topic. I published magazine articles. In order to give the book more flavor, <clears throat> I, I felt that I needed to do something more as a journalist, I felt I needed to spend time in prison, in a prison cell. And so I was able to arrange to spend a weekend voluntary locked inside a cell in Kingston Maximum Security Prison. As far as I know, I was the only reporter in Canada at the time who had done that, voluntary, voluntarily spent time inside a cell in a maximum security prison. At that time, Peter Moon of the Globe and Mail <clears throat> had, uh, had done a story where he stayed inside a maximum security prison. And being a competitive journalist, I wanted to be the one in Canada who did that in a maximum security prison. And I was able to arrange that only because with the warden, only because I had been able to establish trust and respect with the warden and other prison officials, particularly from my reporting on the federal uh, prison inquiry, which was hard for the prison service because it found them at fault. <clears throat> and after finding, after the federal inquiry found the prison service at fault uh, for mistreating female prisoners um, uh, and, and the findings were published, the uh, commissioner uh, of prisons uh, uh, resigned. Um, so uh, let me end there. You know, nobody pays much attention to the byline of a crime story or a police story, um, but prison stories were more unusual. And I think I stood out on, on that beat. And that's part of finding your brand, uh, finding your niche in reporting. What sort of opportunity can you create for yourself through your own enterprise um, that somebody else hasn't, uh, hasn't created. And so good luck with that.